Welcome to the Open Textbook Network's Pub 101. This is meeting two about unit two, building your publishing program. And I would like to thank you for your feedback so far on our curriculum. If you have not yet had a chance to give your feedback on units one and two, please take just a couple minutes and let us know your suggestions for material that would be helpful for you, things that you've seen elsewhere that you think belong in the units, or even your typos, catching typos. All of those things are appreciated. So um, please share so that we can continue to improve the curriculum for future colleagues. So last week, uh, just to kind of orient you to where we are today, we talked about what makes an open textbook a textbook, and we started to explore different publishing models. We also turned our attention to accessibility, and really talked about why it's important to think about and consider and build in accessibility from the start. If you have not yet had a chance to read the comments from our homework in which people drafted alt tags or image descriptions, um, our presenter, Elle, uh, gave some great feedback in the homework and I think there's some really good discussions there and a lot to take away from that. Um, I also invite you to have conversations with each other in the shared document outside of this one hour that we share together. Um, you can comment as many of you already have and then have a conversation that way or engage um, however is easiest in the document directly too. That shared document is an experiment, so please try what you think would work well and um, we'll learn together about how to support one another outside of our time together in Pub 101. So today we're going to zero in on Memorandum of Understanding, or MOUs, which is an important part of building your publishing program. I do want to point out or clarify that in terms of an order of operations, um, you would first have a call for proposals or a CFP. And we're going to talk about that next week, even though it comes before the MOU, and that was just for scheduling reasons. Um, but there really is a relationship between the two. They have a lot in common. I really like to frame them as your communication vehicles. They are ways to tell um, the campus and potential faculty authors and collaborators what you're doing, what your capacity is, what you're looking for. It's almost like building your online dating profile <laughs> in terms of, you know, this is a matchmaking process. You want to find someone who's a good fit for you, especially in the beginning of your program. If you're sort of trying things for the first time, you want to find someone who's like-minded, who understands that you don't have things totally figured out, who understands that they're going to be part of the learning process with you. And I think looking for those qualities in someone um, and making sure that they're, they're on board with that more um, sort of conceptual spirit of uh, exploring new territory together is, is really important. So uh, if you will, think of the CFP and the MOU as matchmaking documents. And um, before we get started and before I hand things over to our very special guest, Carla Myers, I would like to do a couple of polls. Now I understand I did not visually share the results last week and I am sorry about that. I had such a strong start in the first meeting and then forgot to publish our, our polls uh, last week. So I have every intention of uh, showing you guys what um, what's going on out there in Pub 101. So I've launched a poll. There's three questions in this one. If you could just take a couple seconds to respond. The first question, are you guys seeing this? Okay, yes, the results are now coming in. The first question is, have you ever created an MOU? The second question is, have you ever signed an MOU? And the third question is, have you ever sat down and talked through an MOU with involved parties. So let us know. You might not be sure, this MOU stuff might be totally new and that's fine. You might have a long storied career and maybe in the very beginning of it, you did something with an MOU but you can't recall. Results are still coming in, I'll give you guys 10 more seconds. Yes, a little bit like a prenup. I like that too. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm going to share results. 
Okay. Zoom is telling me attendees are now viewing poll results. So have you ever created an MOU? The majority of you, just over half, have not, but a good chunk of you, 40% have. 9% of you maybe haven't had your coffee or can't quite recall. <laughs> You've done a lot of stuff. Um, have you ever signed an MOU almost right down the middle? Yes, 47% of you have signed a memorandum of understanding, 44% have not, 9% again, not too sure. And then finally, have you ever sat down and talked through an MOU with involved parties? 35% of you have done that, but the majority, 58% have not, and 7% are not sure. So a pretty consistent not sure group. So thank you for sharing your MOU experience so far. I am now going to introduce Carla. Carla Myers is Assistant Librarian and Coordinator of Scholarly Communications at Miami University Libraries in Ohio. She's also a member of the Publishing Cooperative. She's gonna talk about MOUs and why they're important. And then after she finishes, we'll have time for Q&A and discussion. And at first, I'd like to focus that Q&A on MOUs and what she um, shares with us this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And if we exhaust that topic, we can op open it up more broadly to questions related to copyright and Creative Commons and even other content covered in Units 1 and 2. Carla has a ton of knowledge to share with us, and I'm delighted she's here. So, um, Carla, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thanks, Karen. Um, it's, I am so excited to be here and talk about these things today. Can you see my screen? Awesome. Okay. So I'm excited to talk with you about um, communication tools and strategies for project management. And in this part, we're talking about MOUs. I want to echo everything Karen said earlier about the call for proposals and your MOU kind of dovetailing each other. So for the call for, for proposals, you're putting out information about we're launching the service, we're doing this project, here's what you need to know, here's what we're looking for. And an MOU or Memorandum of Understanding is kind of a way of formalizing that after you've accepted somebody into the program. So I really wanna echo what Karen said. I think she made a great analogy there. So there's me. Thank you, Karen, for the great introduction. Um, so how does this process work? And <coughs> please bear with me a little bit. My allergies have been really bad the last two weeks, so I'm a little scratchy, um, but I'm gonna try not to cough too much. So the way this usually works is you start off with the call for proposals. You put out there to your campus community, we are going to do this open publishing project. We're excited to announce this. We want you to be part of it. Here's what we're looking for. Here's what you need to know about this. People respond based on their understanding of the information you put forward. You select projects that you wanna work on based on what is the best fit for you. And then comes a time when you want to use a memorandum of understanding or an MOU as a communication tool to kind of formalize this relationship. So MOU stands for Memorandum of Understanding. It's in a way a contract. It's not necessarily a legally binding document, um, but it's kind of a contract that's going to outline here's what we hope to accomplish together. Here's what's going to do what. Here's the timeline that's going to be involved for this particular project. I've seen MOUs that are less than a page long. I've seen MOUs that are six, seven, eight, ten pages long. These can be as long or as short as you want them to be. And people who work with memorandums of understanding will often tell you that what you have is kind of a base MOU and that may grow or shorten depending on who you're working with or what your project's going to be. Especially in relation, I think, to publishing. The more content somebody might be seeking to put into something that you're looking to publish, the longer your MOU may be. But that can be very specific based off your needs for a particular type of project and then for particular sub-projects that fit within the scope of that larger service. So why have an MOU? There's a couple reasons. Um, first off, it sets the tone for the project. Here's what we hope to achieve. Next, it outlines those expectations for everybody. Here is what we expect from you, the author. Here's what we're expecting you to bring us. And here is what you, the author, can expect us to do for you. Um, I think very importantly, it provides a source document to consult if at any time there's ever any confusion or um, uncertainty about what is supposed to be done in a particular setting. 
Um, it can outline um, deliverables, key achievements, budgets, all different kinds of things. Um, but it can generally help prevent confusion about who's supposed to be doing what, when things are supposed to be delivered, and especially I think in terms of budget, what money can and can't be spent on, things like that. So some things to think about with an MOU is first off, who? Who is this agreement between? When we're talking about open textbook publishing, of course it's going to be between the creators, the people who are actually going to create this particular work. But then um, is the agreement with the library? Is it with a larger academic institution? This is a question you want to have, um, this is a question you want to talk with your Office of General Counsel about. If the library is providing the publishing service, then the MOU may be between the creators and the library. But if the institution is funding the service, it may be between the institution and the creators, or it may be all three. But it's something you want to think about who all is part of this agreement. Next, what? What is going to be in your MOU? What do you want to outline? What are you expecting? So from the content creators, generally this is going to be writing the text um, of the open textbook. It could be that they're going to be responsible for finding images and figures or creating images and figures that are going to go into this work. It could be that they are responsible for clearing the permissions for any third party works that will be used in this particular work. Um, it could be all different types of things. And then what are you agreeing to as the library or publishing program that's providing this service? So maybe finding people to contribute to it. I know here at Miami University, one of the conversations we're having as part of our publishing program is graphic design. Um, one of our authors is very hesitant to do this. I can't draw a stick figure to save my life. I'm not about to do graphic design for a book. So we're gonna look for student graphic designers, people we can hire to help support us in this project. And that's a service we will provide. Also, the question of peer reviewers. This is a very contentious one. I hope that's the right word in open textbook publishing. And the reason I say it's contentious is maybe because it can be hard to find good peer reviewers. And I say this as somebody who's been running an open journal for three years. Um, the peer reviewing process can be kind of complicated. And sometimes the authors are expected to find people to do peer review. Sometimes the institution says we'll go out and find peer reviewers. Um, there could be payment to the peer reviewer, sometimes just a small honorarium for their times and efforts. So if you as the institution are gonna be looking for those contributors or reviewers, who you will find, what the timeline will be for that, and any type of honorarium or compensation you might provide for that. Um, ensuring the content requirements. So once you give us your Word document, here's what we are going to give you back. Here's how we're gonna certify um, everything we're looking for is in there and what we're gonna do with that. And then the publication itself, not just the final document, but kind of the timeline and the due dates for when that's going to happen. And then tied to that, something else you wanna have in your MOU is the whens. What is the total project timeline for this particular thing? From the date you sign the MOU, from when you're ready to publish your open textbook in the open textbook library, what does that entire timeline look like? When are the creator's due dates, um, their deliverables? This could be chapters, this could be the whole entire work. It could be graphics and other types of works that they're putting together. I've seen these handled different ways. Sometimes um, institutions will say, we're looking to get a chapter from you every two months. And here's the timeline we're gonna kind of structure things on. Sometimes institutions will say, we just need your final version of the manuscript that's ready to go into peer review or copy editing by this particular date. But that's something that you might want to include in the MOU is what are the due dates for the content creators getting things to you? And then what are your due dates for turning things around and getting them back into the hands of the content creators? The how, how is this going to happen? What file format is, are the content creators going to deliver to you? Generally, I think we see Microsoft Word, but even within the scope of that, do you want them using a particular font? Do you want them using a particular spacing? Do you want them using a particular citation style? If you're going to be sent images and charts and graphs, what types of formats do you want those in? Citations, making sure they're providing clear citations, not only for quotes, but any third party images, whether they're Creative Commons or otherwise that they're using. I had a really interesting experience. Um, it was last year that I was helping somebody with something and they brought me 32 works and they said, you can figure out where these came from, right? They're just things I've collected over my career. Like you can figure this out, you're a librarian. And it was basically 32 chapters from 32 different books, it turned out. Um, and I ended, 
I agreed to do that for them. It's something I will never agree to again. But that ended up taking almost two months of work to try to figure out where did these chapters come from. Um, so it is a learning process on how you're going to handle these things. If the people who are creating these works are doing their work up front and tracking where they're getting things from, their citation should be pretty easy to provide to you. Um, but citations and properly formatted citations are something to think about as well. And of course, there's the copyright component, the authorship considerations. How many people do you have working on this? Is there a one single author for almost everything? Are there multiple authors? Is this going to be considered a work of joint authorship? Are students involved with this project? Have students been creating things? More frequently, I think we see faculty getting involved, um, getting students involved in creating open educational resources. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but there could be considerations on how that's being done. For example, if that's being done as part of a class project, there could be FERPA considerations, depending on how your institution defines an educational record. Uh, there could also be considerations if students are having to turn something in for a grade and as part of that are required to put a certain type of license on that work. I think there are some um, ethical considerations there. It could be a work made for hire situation. Maybe your faculty member is using some of the funds they've been provided to hire a graduate student to help them with the project. Maybe you're like Miami University and they're going to be looking to hire a student to help you with some of these things. Um, so what are those work made for hire? Um, considerations. And then there are also certifications. And sometimes I feel bad talking about this because it makes me sound like I don't trust people. I trust, but I verify. Um, it's, it's checking with the content creators and getting them to verify that this is their own original work and that it hasn't been published somewhere else or in some capacity or in whole or in part that would prevent them from attaching to it an open license that we want to do as part of our publishing program. So for example, you could have a faculty member who is putting together an open textbook and they wish to reuse an article that they published a couple years ago. And they may say, oh, I wrote this article. Of course I hold the copyright in it and I'm just gonna stick this in as chapter five. And of course that's totally okay not maybe necessarily recognizing that as part of their publication agreement when that journal article was published a while back, that they signed their copyright in that work over to the publisher um, so that they can no longer, they no longer have the rights and can't necessarily attach that open license to it. So as part of this process, we do have our authors certify that the work they are providing us is their own original creative work that they've disclosed all authorship considerations, um, whether they're single joint authors, work made for hire, things like that, and that they do have the rights to openly license this work as part of our publishing program. And this is kind of all tied to um, the memorandum of, memorandum of understanding or maybe um, a separate license, a publication license that you might have signed or licenses they might have entered into in other parts, um, in other situations that they've been in, like publishing a chapter as a journal article beforehand. So another part of the memorandum of understanding should be the budget. How much money do you have in total for this particular project? How is that going to be used? And again, these happen in a variety of ways with open publishing programs. Sometimes the author receives an honorarium. Sometimes they don't receive an honorarium. Sometimes they are given a set amount of money, and I'm just gonna make something up, but say $5,000, and they can use that however they wish to fund the project. It could be to hire a student employee to help them do research. It could be to pay somebody to create graphics for them. It could be that they use it for research, to travel to a conference or to go somewhere to do research that's going to help enhance or benefit the open textbook. How are these funds going to be distributed? Is it all going to be granted up front? Um, are all the expenses going to come to the library of the institution and they'll pay those or go through the library of the institution for those to be paid? In regards to the honorarium, will part of it be paid up front and part of it be paid upon publication? what type of expenses could be paid. Um, here you kind of have to pay attention to your institution and the way things are purchased or contract, contracted. Um, it could be certain situations where um, they need to go through a certain vendor for a particular type of software or things like that. So what type of expenses can you pay and how will those be paid? 
And then, of course, there's always the contingencies. Um, for, for lack of a better word, I sometimes call these the escape clauses that are put into the contracts. I think with a memorandum of understanding, it's very, very important to have in there the ability to go back and revise the contract at certain times and for certain reasons. And this could happen in a variety of ways. The biggest way that I see it happening is publishing deadlines. I had an interesting talk with a book editor and they said 80% of their authors miss their publication deadlines. And as a journal editor, I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. I had mentioned this to Karen earlier, but I'm working with an author on an open textbook publishing project. And I met with her early today to talk about all the steps, everything we needed to do to meet our deadline by the end of the year. And she said, Carla, in the last three months, I've had a death in the family. I've been given two new classes to create and launch and teach. I have all these things going on. And you know what? I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this by the end of the year. And I said, with everything else you have on your plate, that's okay. Let's bump this back a little bit. That I would rather give you some extra time, allow you to focus on those things that really need your attention at this moment, like your family, like your students. And we can finagle this and add in an extra three months or so to kind of move this deadline back into 2020. But I would rather give her an extra, that extra time and come up with a product that we're both really pleased with and ready to send into the publication process than to necessarily try to push her and add that stress onto everything else that's going on. So um, I think a key place where you might see that revisions need to be made in the contract is the timeline. And that's not necessarily just on the authors as well. It could be that you had planned to do some work as part of the publication process and then something else up came up with you, um, a personal matter or a big project got dumped on you at work. And now the timeline that you had established for getting your deliverables back to them, you might not be able to meet. So being able to revise things like the timeline, hopefully this won't happen to you, but being able to revise the budget, if you ever have to revise your budget, it would be lovely if you said, we were given another $5,000. What more can we do with this to make this a really awesome project? But it could be that, um, your institution has hit some hard financial times and somebody comes to you and says, we need to take away 10% of that budget or we need to cut back your budget a little bit. Um, so realizing there's could be those situations where maybe the budget would change. But I think the biggest thing I've learned in working in publishing is that um, things happen, things come up, things change, and that's okay. In the end, these projects almost always get done, but if you can be flexible and kind of roll with them, you're going to get there. You'll have frustrations, but you will make it to where you need to be. But having a clause in your MOU saying that this can be revised in certain situations, I think that's an important thing to do. Something else that's never fun to talk about, but is contract cancellations. And this, I think, could come in one of two formats. Um, your author just stops talking to you. And I know that sounds kind of funny, but it's something I've seen as a journal editor is you will have situations where you're really excited about something, you think the author is a great collaborator and they seem to be really excited, and then they stop talking to you and you send emails or you try calling them and you just can't get a hold of them. In most of these situations, something has come up and they're just no longer able to pursue the project or maybe their interests have changed and this just hasn't become a priority for them. But having something in your MOU that outlines in what situations that you might need to cancel the contract. And that could go both ways as well. Again, I hope this never happens to any of you, but it could be that your institution faces an extreme budget situation. And now funds that you thought you had in order to support these projects, maybe they're not necessarily there. Um, so including language in your memorandum of understanding that talks about when might these contracts actually be canceled. So how do you put an MOU together? I'm gonna to kind of go backwards on this slide. A question is, do you wanna draft your own from the ground up or do you wanna go swipe somebody's? Um, whenever you can, go swipe. And that might sound like a funny thing for a copyright librarian to say, but don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. We're gonna take a look at some resources that the OTN has highlighted. They, they are MOUs for publishing programs that other institutions have put together. Start there, see what your colleagues think are important. See what they've put into them that they've realized is critical information or terms to have successful publishing programs. Um, as part of this, be aware of institutional policies and considerations. For example, um, if your union, if your institution has a faculty union, 
that may have um, certain requirements or considerations um, tied to uh, work done above and beyond the normal scope of their job. And you may need to have a conversation with somebody in the union to make sure that the MOU you're putting together addresses the policies and practices they have in place with the contracts between the faculty and the institution. I think my biggest recommendation would be go take a look at the MOUs that are out there that our colleagues have created. Think about what institutional policies and considerations might come into play. And then take all of this to your Office of General Counsel to work with them to put together an MOU that works best for your program and your institution. So here are some of the sample MOUs. Um, so you can go to the publishing curriculum and find some there. I think the Portland State um, University MOU, which was put together by Karen Bjork at Portland State, who I believe is one of our presenters, um, is a great one for anybody to use. I can tell you here at Miami University, it's serving as the basis of our MOU for a couple reasons. Number one, Karen is sharp and fabulous and she's put together a great document. Karen and I were talking about her MOU, and one thing she talked about is it's constantly changing and evolving based off what they're learning with their different publishing projects, that they had a base MOU that they started from, and then because something came up that they hadn't considered before, they modified it for the next project. So I think the Portland State is a really great one to get an idea of what a fabulous MOU looks like for an open publishing project. My tips and recommendations. Use plain language. Um, it's, it's, you want to make sure that this is easily understandable for everybody. And sometimes it's kind of easy to maybe slip into lawyer speak, that you find some great language online that you kind of just want to copy and paste into your MOU, or that it seems more formal. But you want to make sure that everybody can really understand what's being communicated. So as much as possible, use plain language. Organize the document logically. Usually what happens with MOUs is you start off with a scope of the project. Here's what we hope to um, achieve. Then who is responsible for what? What are the deliverables? Here's what the author's gonna do and here's what the institution's gonna do. Here is the timeline for this project. Here is the budget for this project. Here are other considerations that tie into this document. Um, so kind of just having that logical organization and thinking very carefully about what key areas do you need to have covered in this memorandum of understanding. I will say there are some times where you wanna be very specific and there are some times where you wanna kind of be maybe a little vague in your MOU. So for example, something you wanna be very specific on is the reuse of third party works within your open textbook. Um, it could be that you decide as an institution you don't want any third-party works included in the open textbook that aren't Creative Commons works because that just kind of makes it easier um, that you know that they were openly licensed for use in something like the open textbook. So um, in that situation, you might want to have in your MOU that all third-party works must be openly licensed works. It could be that you're willing to consider the use of works under fair use or with permission. You want to spell that out very clearly something I would very much encourage you to include in your MOU is language about where are you getting these third party works from. Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm saying this with love in my heart, how many times I get things from faculty that have third party works in it that aren't cited. And I'm like, oh, citation, how often do you lecture your students on this? And then they say to me, oh, I just found it on Google. I'm sure it's okay to use. Yes, we can reverse image search that on Google, but it's a giant mess. Um, so if you just make it very clear up front that any third party works you use, we need to be able to go back and double check that resource, whether you want that to be openly licensed. So when it comes to copyright, we tend to be very, very specific. Um, when it comes to things like deadlines, you might be a little bit more flexible that it is due by the end of August. You may say it's due August 15th. But just keep in mind that with your MOU, there are some areas where you can and maybe should be flexible, but there are some areas where you want to be very specific as well. And this is something you want to figure out for your institution, what is going to be the best fit for you. Setting expectations. I think it's important to inform your authors and creators early on that signing an MOU is part of the process. Some people will be like, oh, okay, no big deal. I get contracts all the time. I don't read those. I don't need to read this one. We want them to read it. But they're used to signing contracts as part of the publishing process. Other people, sometimes it can freak them out a little bit. Wait, what's this? What's gonna be included in this? What am I doing? What am I signing over? 
I think a good practice is to have the MOU be available as part of the call for proposal process. So you can actually include that in your call for proposals. That part of this will include signing a memorandum of understanding with the library. View our MOU online here. That way, if they have any questions or concerns about the MOU, you can talk about that upfront before you even accept their project rather than after you've accepted it and kind of you've passed that point. I cannot emphasize this part enough. Um, scheduling a meeting to review the MOU line by line with each project participant. I know this sounds a little bit like busy work, but it is so important. I think first off, because as institutions, I think we should want to be clear and transparent with the creators that we're working about. Here's what we're going to expect out of you for having you be part of our publishing program. I think something too is we can never ever take for granted that the people we are working with really understand what is in that MOU. And the example I like to share here is I entered into an MOU with three attorneys not too long ago. And we started to work on the project together. And then at one point, one of the attorneys came back and they're like, wait, why are we doing this way? And I said, well, this is talked about in the MOU. And they said, but I didn't understand that. Like when you talked about that, I didn't understand that. And I'm like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, you're an attorney and, and you read this and you didn't understand something and you didn't ask me. But I just assumed that they were attorneys and I could send them the MOU and if they had any questions, they would ask me. And that was kind of an eye opener that sometimes even the people we expect to be very familiar with this process might not understand something. So going through the MOU line by line, it's a way to say, here's what we're looking for here. Here's what we're expecting out of you. Here's what we're going to do for you. Do you have any questions about this part? This could take you an hour and an hour and a half to do, but it can really save you some headaches down the road. And then being available to answer questions at any time. With our MOUs, we have a meeting, we talk about it, and then I say, I don't want you to sign today. Go home, read this back through, think about it, let me know if you have any questions, and then we'll schedule a time a few days down the road to kind of get back together and talk about this and sign the document then. For MOUs and project management, communication is king. Communicate, communicate, communicate. There is no such thing as over communication, short of emailing them every day and saying, how's it going, where are you at? Um, as I said before, things happen, life happens, unexpected work projects pop up. It's, um, I've had very few projects um, that have actually been brought back to me on time. It's always a treat when that happens. When people are delayed and late, it's almost never because they're trying to make me miserable or that because maybe they're not a very nice person. It's that something has come up that has become a priority for them and they still care about this project, but it's had to be shifted to the back burner. And what I tell people in those situations is that happens. I've had that happen myself with my own publishing deadlines. But I promise you, if you reach out to your editor and say, you won't believe what just happened, you know, um, chances are they're gonna say, okay, I understand, life happens. Let's talk about what a realistic new deadline is. Um, with something like permissions for third party works, it's something to keep in touch with. Um, I know for some institutions, they'll say, okay, any third party works that you're using, like Creative Commons works, we want you to share them to this folder or put information about them into this worksheet, the URL where you got them from. So as we're going through this process, we can keep an eye on these and double check to make sure everything is falling within the scope of our open textbook so that those surprises don't come later. Um, when questions and problems do arise, what part of the MOU can be modified or renegotiated? Um, the MOUs are generally meant to be flexible. It's one of the advantages, but there could be points where you're like, oh, I really do have to draw a line. So for example, you could have somebody say, you know, I've had a family situation come up. I'm not going to make my deadline. Can you push this back two months? Okay, maybe that will work within the scope of our project. They may say, oh, I just got invited to teach in Italy for a year. I'm going to be gone for a year and a half. Can we put this on the back burner for a year and a half? Oh, that, that might make you hesitate a little bit. So knowing ahead of time where you can have flexibility and where you might not be able to, but that that flexibility is so important. Problems can come up with these projects. Roll with them when you can, but also be ready to say no when it kind of goes beyond the scope of what you're able to offer. So I hope this has been helpful. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about memorandums of understanding. 
also copyright questions that are tied to MOUs. And if we don't have any of those, help me with copyright questions. I'm always happy to answer those as well. Thank you very much, Carla. I just want to um, highlight a couple of things you said, um, one of which is uh, the, the, the best you can do is to plan and anticipate and be you know, this killer project manager with all your ducks in a row and then expect some of those ducks to fall out of line and mm -hmm. be flexible. Um, so you'll hear us talk a lot about front loading. We talked about it when we talked about accessibility, like, hey, don't, don't wait until the end to figure this out. And it may be overwhelming as you're trying to think about getting your program started to think about all this stuff at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really a recommendation uh, to set you up for success later. The yes. more you can anticipate now, the more you can plan now, um, the better off you'll be and, and the fewer um, tearful nights you may have. Um, and, oh, sorry, I just had that. What was I gonna say? Moment. Um, the thing about making your MOU and your call for proposals is it will help you define your program. When you swipe mm -hmm. something, you know, Carla mentioned Karen Bjork of Portland State. If you take a look at hers, or you take a look at some of the other ones and you're like, wow, they're mentioning all these different things that's going to help you clarify, you know, are we going to do these different things? Or are they going to do those different things? So trying to think of it holistically, like the MOU isn't necessarily another thing you have to do, although that's true too. The MOU can help you define your publishing program. It's almost a tool or an exercise for, for you, in addition to, you know, for that matchmaking or prenup function in terms of finding the right people for your program at the right stage. So um, Kristen has a question in the chat, and she says that she's curious about how MOUs relate to project charters. What do you mean by project charters? Can you provide a little clarification on that? And Kristen, feel free to unmute if that's easier than writing in the chat. Yeah, I started typing and I realized that that was gonna be harder. Um, so when you, and I'm not coming from a publishing background, so maybe it's just a matter of different practices and different sort of subfields, um, but a lot of the stuff that you were talking about in an MOU context sounded to me like something that um, we in project management work on um, in relating to something that's often called a project charter. It might be called something slightly different than that. Um, and the way that we do that in my institution is actually through what is fundamentally like a spreadsheet form structure. And so it was interesting to hear about how it might be framed on like an author and publisher basis. So I'm just curious if you've heard about project charters and how this sort of might be similar documents. The MOUs that I've worked on have been like one page things that are basically like we, us two entities at our university are going to work together on a thing, but they're very vague. And so it was interesting to learn about how specific and detailed the ones that you're referring to. I think that's a great question. Um, and I'm not familiar with the term project charter. So this is, I'm learning something new today. And you're exactly right. These MOUs can be as short or as long as you want. Um, the MOU could be, we and the author are gonna work together to create this open textbook. It's due by this date. It has a budget of X amount of money. The end, everybody signs. Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with an MOU like that. But I think based off my publishing experience, I like to be much more clear and thorough. Um, and that's why, if I'm understanding what a project charter is, here's what we hope to achieve, here's how we're gonna achieve it, here's when we're gonna achieve it, here, who's going to do what. I think that's kind of very much what an MOU is. And um, the thing I like about MOUs, and let me see, I think our draft MOU, and we're still drafting it, I think right now is at almost eight pages long, um, but that's because we're kind of trying to clearly define who is responsible for what, to be very upfront with all of that. Um, not only the author, but what we as the library are going to do to help eliminate confusion. Not only, I thought you were gonna coordinate peer review. No, I thought you were gonna coordinate peer review but also in terms of um, copyright, of third-party works, of licensing those. We have an interesting situation with one where somebody paid somebody else to like to create some stuff and what are we gonna do in that situation? Um, so I think with MOUs, it is my personal preference to see a longer one that kind of does talk about who is this between, um, what is everybody going to do, how are they going to do it, and when are we going to do it by, and how much money is going to be available to support all of this. 
Um, so it can be very short and succinct and that may work for your institution. It's my personal preference to have something a little bit longer that just helps better identify what everybody's doing and how. Is that helpful, Kristen? Yes, thank you. I, okay. I appreciate and agree with your desire for specificity. Mm -hmm. and it. <laughs> Kristen, thank you too for sharing a project charter template. I think that's really helpful and we're probably um, sort of talking about both of those things are similar things and just trying to define what we're going to do on what timeline and so maybe uh, one possible workflow would be working on the project charter um, together and then sort of formalizing that more in a in an MOU and in a text heavy way um, but the, the main idea is to sort of define everything get it as clear as possible um, so that there aren't too many surprises later um, Carla, another question is from Jonathan. He's, question, he's curious as to whether an MOU is a legal document or not. Does it need to be checked over by the campus attorney? Does he have the right to sign it or does he need to start the process so that eventually it will be on his campus president's desk for signature? Okay, um, so generally, yes, it depends, it depends. Um, so. An MOU is a contract, um, and a contract can be a legal document. Now, I don't know how far I might get in court if I wanted to sue one of our authors over an MOU. I don't know if it's necessarily that formal of a contract that it would necessarily hold up in court, and that's kind of a really complicated non-answer. Um, but it's not as formal of a contract that institutions often enter into. Um, somewhere here else on my desk, I wish I could show this to you. I have a contract that I'm working on right now with our Office of General Counsel and between another organization that's four pages long of all lawyers speak. Um, MOUs generally don't look like that. But it is a contract and a contract can be a legal document. I think there's benefits to having it checked over by your campus attorney. Um, if you have a great relationship with your Office of General Counsel, and if you don't, this might be a good time to start to establish one. Attorneys are our friends. 98% of them are delightful. Don't believe all you know the jerk attorneys that you see on TV. Um, so I think the benefits for Office of General Counsel is number one, they're gonna have experience writing contracts, and they might think of something that you haven't thought of yet. Do you wanna address this particular topic? Have you thought about that? Um, something else they might know is nuances of the institution that you might not be familiar with. So for example, um, with the whole unionization thing, that if you have an institution where there is a union, it's very specific in their contracts how work outside the scope of their normal employment is handled. Personally, um, not that we're unionized here at Miami University, but in those situations, I'm not even gonna try to draft it because we really want an attorney who is um, familiar with what's in those contracts and who can draft something that's gonna kind of run alongside of those. So it can also be useful to have um, your Office of General Counsel just kind of know what you're working on and be aware of the particular situation. So again, um, trust but verify. It's I have a faculty member who signs the MOU and says, yes, I'm the rights holder. I haven't entered into any other agreements whatsoever um, that you know would impact my ability to openly license this particular work here. And then we end up six months later getting an email from some major publisher saying, hey, there's parts in here that were published in a book by this person and we're going to sue you if you don't take this down, all these different copies. This is an extreme situation. I haven't heard of this happening. But in this particular situation, your attorney is aware of what you were doing with this publishing program. They looked over the MOU. They kind of have a place to start with what do we do now in terms of retracting this particular work? Or does this publisher really have a case for the argument that they're making? Um, in terms of signing authority, that is a fabulous question. Um, given the work that I do at Miami University, I do work with the Office of General Counsel. I do copyright work with all the different departments here. Despite all this, I do not have signing authority on behalf of Miami University. Um, that's not granted to me. Um, now, I might have signing authority on behalf of the library to enter into a contract that um, my dean has signed off on with the group who we're gonna get to get to do some graphic design with us, or maybe there's somebody in the dean's office who can do that. Generally, generally for our memorandums of understanding, 
It could be somebody like your dean or your department head or maybe even you as the project manager. Um, it's just not the same level of signing authority as some contract that's being entered to, into on behalf of the university. Um, let me see if I can say this a little bit better. If your publishing program is small and offered out of your library, chances are the person who needs to sign that contract is somebody in the library, whether that's your dean, your department head, or you. If you have a university press, it could be the press director who signs these, or because that press is an extension of the university, it could be somebody in the president or provost office or somebody in the office of general counsel. But I think that's something that you wanna talk with your office of general counsel about. Um, as far as I'm aware with our MOUs, I will be the one signing it as the project manager with my dean's awareness and blessing having signed off on our particular project. Thanks for your question, Jonathan, and thanks, Carla. Ariana has a question. She's curious about how MOUs would be applied in situations where there's not funding for publishing OER. How would that change the MOU or the process of implementing an MOU if there's no money involved, I think is the crux of the question. It really shouldn't change it much. Um, you could choose just not to have a section in it that talks about funding. You could choose to have a section in there that says, um, you know, in terms of funding, the only funding we can provide is our grateful and undying support for the work that you're doing. You may wanna clarify that there are no royalties to be paid on the work. I'm glad you brought this up. I had forgotten about this scenario. Karen, I think I shared this with you. We had somebody who was super excited to enter into our publishing program. We were pretty much to the point where we were ready to sign the MOU. And then he said, well, what about my royalties? And I said, oh, well, this, this is an open textbook. You know, the idea is that it's freely available for anybody who wants it. And while we're providing you an honorarium up front, there won't be any royalties. And he was like, oh, but, but I have a son going into college and I was planning on using the royalties to help cover those expenses. And if there's not going to be any royalties, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And part of me was like, but, but, but we've talked about this multiple times and I've said open and freely available. So I'm not certain where this confusion came from. But after that, I'm like, now I need to put in the MOU that there are no royalties from this, that all we offer is the upfront honorarium. So I'm so glad that you brought that up because I forgot to share that example as part of my presentation. So in your situation where there's not funding for this, you might not necessarily have the section that talks about the project budget and how funds can be spent or what they can be spent on, things like that. But instead, you could still have a part that maybe talks about that there are no royalties that will be paid to the author um, and that all work will be done in-house, you know, with no budget to help support it. Um, I'm sure there's better ways to word that, and that's something your Office of General Counsel can help you out with as well. But it would either just be putting in what pertinent financial information might go there, um, or just pulling that section out in its entirety. Ariana, to add what, to what Carla said, um, in, the, in Unit 3 on MOUs, and I put that link in the chat, uh, there's a video from Office Hours in which uh, Meredith Jacobs from Creative Commons says the same thing, that it's, this isn't necessarily or this isn't only about the exchange of you know, money for work. This is really clarifying, if you will, all of the elements of the project charter, all of the things um, that you're going to do and that that other person is going to do so that you can be on the same page. Um, we have a few more minutes, so please uh, think of your questions for Carly about MOUs, copyright, um, or other related things. In the meantime, Carla, I'm wondering if you have recommendations for that sit-down meeting when you do talk through the MOU. Um, any, any tips on how to make that pleasant and clear? Sure. Um, so I send them a copy of the MOU ahead of time and I'll say, you know, we had talked about the memorandum of understanding at this upcoming meeting. We're going to go through it line by line. Please read this through ahead of time and flag any things that you have questions about that you want to discuss in depth. Um, it's I try to schedule it for a coffee shop or someplace where we can kind of just sit back and have a conversation. I'm usually like, I'm so excited you're coming on board. We're so excited for this project. This is going to make such an impact. Now our step of formalizing this and getting started is a memorandum of understanding. So let's go through this line by line. And that's literally what we do. Okay, the scope of the project. Here's what we're hoping to achieve. You know, an open textbook that's freely available for anybody to access. The copyright part, you know, 
what's your certification as a sole author or disclosing other authors? Um, you know, it's, it's what's your certification in that there are no other agreements that might control how this content is openly licensed. So we literally just go through it line by line. I read the line and then I say, here's what we mean by this. Do you have any questions? I try to make them feel as comfortable as possible in asking questions. Sometimes, especially when it comes to copyright, I feel like people hesitate a little bit because it, we've all felt that before. I don't want to feel stupid. This is probably a really stupid question. Oh, she's going to think I'm an idiot if I ask that. No, when it comes to a contract, there's no stupid questions whatsoever. Ask me anything because I want to give you as much information as I possibly can so you can make an informed decision because if you're not comfortable with this and you sign off it in any way, like that goes just against everything I believe ethically as a librarian and promoting open scholarship. So send it to them ahead of time, find a time where you can both relax. I would say plan about an hour and a half for this meeting. It might not go that long. Go through line by line, have a conversation about everything, share as much information as you can, make them comfortable in asking those questions. And again, I tell them, I don't want you to sign this today. Go back home, take this copy with you with your notes, think about it, sleep on it, see if you have any other questions, and we'll find a time later this week or next week where we can meet and sign this together. Um, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I think it is. And, and just for people who are, you know, starting out and this may be their first time um, creating an MOU, it could be too that in the meeting you discover, oh, this is not the final mm -hmm. draft of the MOU. You know, he, this author raised a wonderful question that I hadn't thought about. And now we can talk about, you know, well, what will that look like? Do we know? Mm -hmm. um, and so you may end up adding a few lines too. It, it really is a process. So um, it's good not to create the expectation that you're mm -hmm. you know, creating this wonderfully complete document. Um, you might make some discoveries as well, and that's okay. So and I think that's, oh, I'm sorry. No, please go. I was gonna say, I think that's a fabulous point for a couple reasons. Number one, I think it goes back to the flexibility. There might be something small that you can do to make them more comfortable with it. Um, it could also be based off their knowledge area. So one of the faculty members I'm working with teaches chemistry. Let me tell you how much I suck at chemistry. Um, but she may say, what about this? And it's something very specific to her field that I didn't even think of because I'm coming from a library or publishing background. So it should be like, oh, you know what? That's a great point. Let me take notes and go back to my boss or Office of General Counsel and see how we can incorporate that in. Again, it's with publishing, you have this idea of how you're going to do it, but being flexible and just kind of going with the flow and being open to thoughts and comments and being willing to change things where you can, it's just going to lead to a more successful project. And like you said earlier, maybe a few less tears. Yes. No one's life is on the line. No. It may sometimes have that intensity, but indeed it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, two more questions I think we can fit in. So Larry says that he has a faculty member writing a book on design. It's from scratch, it's not an adaptation, and they did not have an MOU. Is it okay? Um, he describes their, um, their arrangement as a collegial working arrangement. That is up to you, Larry, I think. Um, what's your most comfortable with? I think maybe the one place I would encourage you to get something in writing is a certification that they are the original author, um, that it is all their own original created work, except where maybe they have designated otherwise, like with quoting or providing a citation to a third party work, and that they have not entered into any type of agreement with anybody else that may inhibit your ability to openly license this. Um, and I think that just comes from experience. It's I say this with love in my heart, so many faculty have signed their publication agreements for books, book chapters, articles, um, and never read them. And then they think, but I created that, I wrote that, I'm the rights holder, so I can reuse part of this, I can reuse the whole thing. One publication agreement that I reviewed for a faculty member, I could pull it out of my drawer because I still show it to my fellow copyright librarians to shock them. What it basically said is, you cannot reuse any part of this work whatsoever without our explicit permission. And what I told the faculty member is, I need you to understand that if you sign this publication agreement, you can't take a sentence from this and put it in a PowerPoint. You can't take a chart or a graph, and, graph or an image and use it in something else. Like you are wholly and totally not only signing your copyright over, but because it's in this contract, your ability to reuse this content in any way whatsoever without their explicit permission. Um, so in that situation, if that person who signed that agreement later wanted to include a chart or a graph in their open textbook, 
they may think, oh, well, I created it. I'm the rights holder, but they're not. And now they're in violation of that agreement. So maybe just a little thing about the copyright, kind of certifying all that. If you think you have a great working relationship for everything else, um, that may work for you. It's, it's people can do this without MOUs. But the copyright is always the part that makes me a little bit nervous. Thanks for your question. So I think we have uh, time for Jonathan's question. We have five minutes remaining. Can, okay. you, can you describe cases where one side or the other of the MOU is not doing what they promised and how the MOU might be used or leveraged at that point? Is it a threat or is it a guideline? Or maybe mostly it's used at the beginning to set expectations and if they're not met, the MOU may be irrelevant. So, um... I can give you two examples. So one example comes from me being a journal editor. And I had somebody who was working on an article for me and didn't get it to me and didn't get it to me. And um, I was and I'm still friends with this person. And so it kind of surprised me when they weren't responding to my emails or, you know, I would call them and um, there was no answer on the phone or my messages weren't being returned. And this sounds really devious and awful, but I'm like, hmm. They know where I live and they probably recognize my area code if I call from my office, but my cell phone area code has nothing to do with where I lived at that point. So I called them on my cell phone and they picked up and they said, hello, so-and-so, you know, so-and-so library. And I said, hey, so-and-so, it's Carla. And it was the most pregnant pause I have ever experienced in my life. And they said, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I've been avoiding you. I'm so sorry it's not done, but let me tell you everything that's been going on they had all kinds of things going on in their personal life. And they said, I haven't forgotten about you. I didn't ignore you. I just felt so bad that I wasn't getting what you want. And you know, you're my friend and I disappointed you. And I said, that's okay. Life happens. I, I, I wish you would have just communicated this to me because you know, you've been stressing for nothing. Um, so in that situation, there was the expectation that they would get me something by some due date. The communication fell apart. And I said, you know what? what do you need? Do you need three months? Do you need six months? Do you want to drop this all together? Um, so in that situation, life just kind of came up and we were able to say, okay, you know what? We're going to extend this a little bit. We're going to get it done. And so um, most of the time, that's what it is, is things have come up. And in those situations, you can say, let's go to the MOU and see where we can change our due dates, where we can revise these projects. Um, again, even with the example I shared earlier, with that person who has all these things going on that semester. She said, I can get this done if you really need me to get this done. And I said, you know, number one, you have bigger fish to fry. And number two, I would rather push this back a little bit and, and put together a product we're both really proud of than have you rush on top of everything else you're doing. So 95% of the situations are like that. Another situation I've dealt with as a journal editor is um, just an author who decided to become contrary very late in the process, um, wanting to make changes that weren't acceptable after the peer review process. Um, sometimes they weren't talking to me. When they were talking to me, they were kind of being a little bit snippy. Um, at one point, we were two months beyond a particular deadline, and part of that was because they weren't talking to me or they weren't returning things to us. And finally, what I said to this person is, you know, we're excited to work with you on this. And we all have put so much time and effort into this content. And I hope we can move forward with this. But at this point, numerous deadlines have been met. We are not getting what we need from you. And I need you as the author to make a decision. Do you wanna move forward with this project? And if so, here are the deadlines that need to be met. Or if this project's no longer a priority for you, let me know now and you know what, we'll just let this go. So I think that's another thing an MOU can be useful for in those situations and they are pretty rare, is to say, you know, what happened here? And here's what we expected, and we've been as flexible as we can be, but at this point, we need an honor, honest answer from you about whether you can deliver what's been promised in the MOU, or if you can't, okay, we're just going to, and that's why you have that cancellation clause in there, we're going to go ahead and cancel this, you know, we're going to put this project aside and move on to something else, both of us. Um, I always try to keep these conversations as congenial as possible, even when they're kind of being a little snippy with me. I never know what's going on in their life. You know, maybe it's stress that's causing them to do that. But um, just leaving it as positive as possible because maybe they want to come back at some time later and say, hey, things have cleared up and I'm eager to come back to this project if you'll have me back. Um, so I think MOUs can be used both ways, either to be flexible when people need it or to hold people accountable and decide if this project is still viable for both of you. 
Thank you, Carla. We are seconds away from the top of the hour. Please thank Carla for joining us uh, before we adjourn. We learned so much from you. And we will continue this project management conversation, um, how the CFP fits into the MOU when Karen Bjork visits with us next week. For your homework, please review unit three and um, have a great week until we see you again. Uh, thank you, Carla, and thank you all for being here in Pub 101. Farewell. Thanks, everybody. I'm so excited to be part of this.